Alright, so Second Chron Second Chronicles chapter 20, continuing our look at Jehoshaphat. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for this time with your word. And I thank you, God, because it is it's your word that we look to. It is your word that is, is our foundation that we can stand upon and know that every bit of it is true from in to amen. And of course, we stand upon the rock, the living word of God, Jesus Christ. There is no sure foundation. And Lord, I pray that this time would bless you, that Jesus Christ would be magnified. I pray, Lord, that, that this time does bless you. And God, I thank you for the privilege and the honor of serving you Thank you, Lord, for your Son, that you sent him to live among us, that he lived a perfect life here on earth, never ever sinning, that he died on the cross as the Lamb of God, sacrificed for my sins. He was then buried in the tomb, and on the third day, Jesus Christ arose from the dead. And Lord, we thank you because he's alive forevermore. And we so look forward to seeing him soon. And these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we're going to start at verse 1. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other besides the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Hazazan Tamar, which is En Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared, and set himself to seek the Lord, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Now after Jehoshaphat, had sinned and it had an alliance with Ahab, the king of the northern kingdom of Israel, the Lord sent Jehu to rebuke Jehoshaphat. And if you'll look across the page to chapter 19, verse 2, And Jehu the son of Hanani the seer went out to meet him and said to king Jehoshaphat, Shouldst thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. So God's wrath was still on Jehoshaphat because of the sins against the Lord, because he sinned, he helped the ungodly Ahab and went to battle with him. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and others went to war against Jehoshaphat in the southern kingdom of Judah. Jehoshaphat, he had been willing to fight alongside the ungodly Ahab against the Syrians, something that he should never have done. And now Jehoshaphat was going to have these, to fight these armies from the east. And please take careful note of Jehoshaphat's reaction to the news. Look at verse 3 in chapter 20. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Jehoshaphat feared. 
the Moabites and the Ammonites and the others were coming to fight. And Jehoshaphat was afraid of what might happen. At one time, the Moabites had enslaved Israel. And several times, the Ammonites and others were now coming to fight. And they had fought with Israel in the past. And, and he was concerned about what might happen. And when, so when you think about it, the two of them together, plus the other unnamed armies, they were thought to be a formidable force. And they came to attack Judah from beyond the sea on this side, Syria, means that they came from the other side of the Dead Sea. Re remember in 2 Chronicles 17.10 it said, And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the land that were round about Judah, so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. So these nations no longer feared about going to battle against Jehoshaphat. What you need to realize is that there are future consequences to your sins that you never thought to anticipate. There are. There, there are. They will come up. It is possible that these nations knew of Jehoshaphat's affinity with Ahab and that lowered their view of Jehoshaphat. Maybe they viewed Jehoshaphat and Judah as weaker now after the battle Jehoshaphat and Ahab waged against Syria. So remember, they didn't win that battle. Ahab lost his life. Syria won. Like a rock dropped into a calm pond, there are ripple effects of your sin that you never expect. Now after receiving the news of the coming attack, Jehoshaphat was fearful. There's nothing wrong with being afraid as long as you respond properly to that fear. Your fear must send you to the Lord God in prayer. But is that what happens? Often no. How often do you end up fretting and worrying? How often do you choose to isolate yourself from God and others? So you begin to chew on your fingernails and obsess over what might happen and what could happen when you should be instead humbling yourself before the Lord and casting all your cares upon him. Fear can be a useful thing, but it can also be a very harmful feeling. It is all in how you react to being fearful. If you choose to allow the fear to control you, then you've already lost. Jehoshaphat feared, Jehoshaphat feared, and set himself to seek the Lord, meaning that Jehoshaphat resolved to go to the Lord in prayer and to seek the Lord. He made that determination and really when, and, and was not going to allow anything to waver him from that. Now in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, we read about Noah. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now think about it for a moment. God had warned Noah that it was going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights and that he was going to flood the earth. The concept of rain was new for Noah, and the thought of a flooded earth had to be daunting, and it was a global flood. It was not a local flood, as some would try to say. It was not a fable or a story. This was an actual event that did happen. Noah did not allow his fear to stop him from believing what God had told him, and he built the ark according to God's specifications. He didn't panic and just try to build a rowboat and try to save himself. 
he still followed what God said to do. Noah was moved with fear, and he did not allow the fear to control him. And like I said, in a lot of ways, fear can be a good motivator. Noah built that ark. It took 100 years to build that ark. you got to think, 50 years in, you think, well, is this really going to happen? Yes, because he knew and trusted in the Lord. doesn't matter if it takes a lengthy amount of time before God fulfills his promise. He will fulfill his promise. <coughs> Jehoshaphat set himself to seek the Lord, meaning he resolved to go to the Lord and seek help from God alone. Think of it kind of like this. You pour cement into a mold, and immediately the set, cement begins to set. It hardens and takes on the shape of the mold and will not move. Likewise, Jehoshaphat set himself to seek the Lord. He was determined to seek the Lord's help and would not waver and would not move. When you go to the Lord in prayer, you go to him humbly, and you go to him with confidence, knowing that the Lord hears you and will do what is best for you. Please do not waver as you pray. As it is written in Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. God will help us. We don't have to go in shaking and quivering before him. We can go to him humbly and contritely and pray to him. And that idea of, you know, don't waver when you're praying because we can pray with confidence that God will answer the prayer. We can pray with confidence that God will hear our cry. We don't have to does he hear me today? Did I speak loud enough? Is he busy elsewhere? He hears you and he knows. So go boldly to the throne of grace where you find that God's mercy endures forever and ever. Do not, do not peek around the corner to see if it is safe to approach the throne of grace. Go forward, believing what is written in the Bible and trusting in the Lord. Do not allow yourself to be pulled away by those around you. Do not let your cell phone distract you away from the throne of grace. Do not doubt, do not waver as you go to the Lord in prayer. Right, chapter 20, go to verse 3. <coughs> Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. <coughs> so Jehoshaphat called for a fast throughout the land. And the fast is a time of humility and mourning over sin. You refrain from eating physical food and refrain even from labor in order to exercise yourself spiritually and seek the Lord in prayer. Jehoshaphat knew that wrath was upon him for his sins in associating with the ungodly Ahab, and he called the kingdom of Judah to join him in fasting and in prayer seeking the Lord's help. The people of Judah favorably responded and they gathered together in prayer. They left their homes, they in their cities, and they went to Jerusalem to seek the Lord. And when you think about that for a moment, Jehoshaphat had laid the foundation for this beforehand. Because remember, back in 17, when he took over the kingdom, what was one of the first things he did? He set out the, the priests and the Levites and the princes throughout all the land of Judah to teach them the word of God. 
And then when, as we saw last week in chapter 19, after his sins with Ahab, he came back and he did it again and sent the people out again to teach. And it says there in chapter 19, verse 4, and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. And so he set this foundation in place so that when this storm came, they were ready for it. The people were ready. They already knew what a fast was. He didn't have to say all of a sudden, oh, we need to fast. He didn't have to say, oh, we need to prayer. And they're like, what's a prayer? And it amazes me when we have people calling for National Day of Prayer. Who are they praying to? Do they understand what it means to pray to the Lord God of heaven? Is, do they even think of Jesus Christ with these things? Sadly, no. They don't know Jesus Christ. They don't. But Jehoshaphat had the people ready so that when the time came, they knew what to do. And it's that proper preparation that we need to have every day. All right, verse 5, chapter 20, verse 5. <clears throat> Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. So the people, they gathered in Jerusalem around the temple, seeking the Lord God in prayer. And they realized the danger that the combined armies were to them. And unlike previous kings, Jehoshaphat did not run to a neighboring kingdom and pay them to fight off the invaders. Jehoshaphat did not take money from the Lord's treasury or remove valuables from the temple to bribe the attacking army to go away. Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah did the right thing and they prayed and they fasted. Drop down to verse 13 for a moment. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. So it was not just the men that left the towns and the cities and came down to Jerusalem for this. They brought their wives, they brought their children along, young and old, came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord. What a wonderful thing that is, that they brought them all to that. And you know what? You don't read of where they had to segregate the children into junior temple, or anything like that. They were all there for the prayer and fasting. In 2 Chronicles 7, 15, the Lord God had promised Solomon, Now mine eyes shall be open, and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place, referring to the temple. And the people of Judah had been taught the scriptures, and they believed them, and now they acted upon them. And that must be your response as well. You have been taught the Bible. Now you must believe what you have been taught and what you have read in the Bible, and that will then drive you to the proper action. It may not feel like God is not listening when you pray, pray but he does hear you. Examine yourself, though. Beg the Lord to show you any sin that you have not repented of. Be sure that your motivations for prayer are pure. Be patient, for the Lord's timing is always perfect. He may be four days late, but he's always on time. When Jehoshaphat's father, Asa, was being threatened by Beasha, the king of Israel, Asa did not go to the Lord in prayer, but instead sought help from a heathen nation. Now previously, the Lord had helped Asa when the Ethiopians attacked, because Asa had prayed. But Asa failed to pray when Beasha attacked, and Asa's pride cost him dearly. The kings were restricted from performing any of the priest's duty at the temple. However, the kings were allowed to pray before the people, 
And as Solomon had done previously, now Jehoshaphat prayed. Now, I should amend that a little bit. It cost Asa dearly because it cost him his health. It cost him his relationship with God in so many ways because he would not repent. we got to be careful about that. It didn't restrict them from performing. They were always never allowed to do any of the priestly duties. I just didn't want you to misunderstand me. The kings have always been, the kings are not priests. There's only one priest king, and that's Jesus Christ. And so Solomon was able to go ahead and speak to the people. And he, and he did speak to the people in a wonderful prayer that you see in 1 Kings about that. Now, Jehoshaphat gets up before the people. Go to chapter six, hmm, 2 Chronicles 20, go to verse 6. And we're going to read that whole passage. This is Jehoshaphat's prayer. O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Are not thou our God? who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gave us to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? And they dwelt therein, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil cometh upon us, as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house, and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house." And cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou, then thou wilt hear and help. <clears throat> and now behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldst not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession which thou hast given us to inherit. O oh, 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 our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And what a wonderful prayer this is by Jehoshaphat. And you like, I like especially that last phrase that he says, but our eyes are upon thee. They were looking to the Lord. Now, you think about it, like at the store, when I'm out on the sales floor, and I'll see parents pushing their children in their strollers. They'll see and they'll, you know, a baby, a newborn, not, you know, you know, one year old or younger, months old. And that baby is sitting in the stroller and they're facing. And what do you so often see as they're pushing that stroller? That baby. Their eyes are locked on the parent or whoever it is pushing them. Why? Because that's what they know. That's what they can trust in. That's what they look to. That should be us with the Lord God. And I praise God because we can be looking to him and he's not on his cell phone. He's looking back. He's listening. He's paying attention. What a wonderful God we serve. And so Jehoshaphat, he begins his prayer by glorifying the Lord and pointing out for all to hear that the Lord is all-powerful and rules over all the kingdoms of the earth, including the kingdoms of the heathen. The heathen may not know of the one true God, and they may not acknowledge that he is over all of them, but what they believe does not change the fact that the Lord is preeminent over everyone and all things. And so a person can sit and say, oh, I don't believe in God, or I don't believe in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter. They're still over you. There's, Jesus Christ is still your Lord, whether you recognize it or not. Jehoshaphat is praising the Lord, which follows the example given by Jesus Christ when he told the disciples about the model prayer. And really, there is plenty to praise the Lord about, and your prayers should begin with praises. 
No nation, no matter how powerful, is able to stand against the Lord. The army of Assyr from Assyria besieged Jerusalem years later, and their leader mocked the Lord and told the people in Jerusalem that no other gods had been able to stand against the Syrian army, and the Lord would fall too. The angel of the Lord showed that army, the Assyrians, quite differently, and he smote 185,000 men in that army in one night. None can withstand the Lord, for no nation and no one man can fight and defeat the Lord. Jehoshaphat reminds the Lord that God has, had given them this land, and he acknowledges that it was the Lord that had driven out the previous inhabitants of the land, land that had been promised to Abraham. Now in verse 8, Jehoshaphat points out that they had built the temple for the Lord. Not that the Lord needs a dwelling place, and he had provided them with the materials to build the temple, and they built it in his name in order to glorify God. The temple was there as a reminder of the Lord's presence and gave them a place to gather to worship the Lord. If, when evil cometh upon us, as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. We can pray to the Lord any time and at any place, but it is truly special to gather as a people to pray to the Lord and to worship him together. When evil comes upon us, you must go to the Lord in prayer and tell others as well about your burdens. The Lord will hear you and he will help you. When affliction comes upon you, cry out to the Lord. If you're part of the body of Christ, you think about your body. You know, think about our bodies as we get older. We all have different aches and pains that happen. You know, and all of a sudden, a part of your body may begin to hurt, and you don't know, I didn't bump it, I don't have a bruise, what happened? But what is that doing? The part of the body is saying, there's something wrong here, because that's what pain is. It's an alert saying, something's wrong here. And it lets you know, in your physical body, something's wrong. As the body of Christ... No, I don't know when a particular person is hurting from one thing or another because I can't read your minds, but you can let me know. Just as when my little toe may hurt from something, it lets me know it's in pain. And you know, a little toe is not quiet. We're to share one another's burdens. That's what God has told us to do. Now in verse 10, Jehoshaphat gets specific about what he is praying about. He tells the Lord of the invading armies and their history with Israel. Now obviously the Lord knows the history and he knows of the afflictions of, upon Judah, but he still wants you to pray to him. We're still to go to him in prayer. He knows all that is happening, so you're not telling him anything new, but he wants you to pray to him anyways. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Tell it to Jesus. That's what we're to do. He wants us to talk to him. And we see this example over and over throughout the Bible of this type of prayer. When praying, pray with specifics. Pray reminding the Lord what he has said and promised and done before in the scriptures. Pray, reminding the Lord what he has done in your life and in the lives of others. It is not that God has forgotten what he has promised and he has not forgotten what he has done, but when you think about it, when you pray in this fashion, 
you are also reminding yourself of God's mercy and his actions in the past. And really, that's very comforting to remind yourself of these things. Now, toward the end of the exodus from Egypt, the Israelites went by Moab and, the Am and where the Ammonites lived, and the Lord would not allow them to attack either nation. The Israelites had victories over other nations, but God specifically did not want them to attack Moab or Ammon. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, God warned against attacking those of Mount Seir, the Ammonites, and the Moabites because those lands were given to the children of Esau with Mount Seir and to the children of Lot, Ammon, and Moab. Jehoshaphat closes his prayer with this plea. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Jehoshaphat acknowledges that they are weak and that the invading army is mighty. He also realizes that they are unsure what to do. And in this sentence, Jehoshaphat shows that he knows that the Lord is mightier than the great company against them, and that they trust God implicitly. It is a great army approaching, but God is stronger by far. Your afflictions may seem to be great, but you serve the God that is greater. Do you trust the Lord? Can you cast all of your cares upon him and leave them with him? Jehoshaphat feared, and he did not allow that fear to paralyze him. Instead, he prayed, and he fasted, and he trusted in the Lord. Look on now to verse 14, chapter 20, verse 14. <clears throat> Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jeiel, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou king Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through Jehaziel, and God gave a quick response to Jehoshaphat's prayer, and he gave them words of comfort. Their circumstance appeared to be dire and difficult, but the Lord told them to not be afraid or dismayed. The Lord does have the situation well in hand. Jehoshaphat would not be able to fight and win against the great company coming, but the Lord God would fight this battle and win. And Jehoshaphat trusted God. And especially as you when you read the rest of this chapter, it takes a whole lot of trust to fight this battle that was coming up. But God will take care of it. And how wonderful. Jehoshaphat didn't run to another nation and say, Here, here's some money. You know, fight for me. You know what amazes me? Because we see this several times in Kings and Chronicles where a king did get scared and did run to Egypt, did run to Syria, did run to all these other kingdoms saying, Here's a whole bunch of money. But you know where they always ended up taking the money from? They took it from the temple. They took it from the, the valuables that were in God's house. They didn't take it from their own. They stole from God to feed their fear when they could have just trusted in the Lord. But how often do we do that? We steal from God because we're scared. And then it all works out we forget to repent 
and ask forgiveness. The Lord has every situation well in hand. We don't need to fret. We don't need to worry. We don't need to chew on our fingernails. God will fight the battle and win. Why don't you allow the Lord to fight your battles? Why don't you let go of your pride and wait on the Lord to have the victory? The battle is not yours, but God's. If you fight the battle, you may win, but it may not be a sure victory. And in the end, who receives the glory for the victory? You do, not God. Trust the Lord to battle for you each and every day. We may put on the armor of God because it protects us from all those things. It's God that does the fighting. Praise the Lord for that. And let's pray. Our God and our Father, again, I thank you for this time with your word. And I thank you, Lord, for the events in Jehoshaphat's life. I thank you, Lord, for the things that we're learning and can apply in our own lives from what we saw in of what Jehoshaphat did both in his sin and in his walk with you, Lord. Lord, I pray we remember these things each and every day. And I pray, Lord, that daily we would seek to lift up Jesus Christ before others, but also to remind ourselves every day of the gospel of Jesus Christ to preach to ourselves the gospel of Jesus Christ, that good news. God, I thank you for your loving kindness upon us. And I thank you, Lord, for being my God. And I pray that as we go through this week, we would remember that we are your ambassadors and your ministers to others. That we would, would give to others of ourselves just as you have given to us. And this I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.